Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of the show, and you know I, I get such uh, pleasure out of having great conversations with smart founders, entrepreneurs, CEOs of different companies. Check some of the archives. We've got some great episodes back there with founders or CEOs from Netflix and, and Kinkos and YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table, many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise Twenty Five, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And my guest this week. Stu Wolf, he's a seasoned entrepreneur. He's a business coach, certified EOS implementer, Detroit chair at Tiger 21. He started a company doing sales and marketing services in the food services industry back in 1997, changed ownership, and then rebranded as the Wolf Group, which they built up to 40 employees managing sales of 140 million. And then he started working with the founder of EOS, that's the Entrepreneurial Operating System, Gina Wickman, who will go check out my archives because I've interviewed him as well. And along with the help of a great leadership team, grew to over 160 employees across 10 states and managing over a billion dollars in sales, made 10 strategic acquisitions to increase their footprint, and then in April 2013, sold it. And now is a business coach and professional EOS implementer, implementing EOS for other businesses as well, as well as running a peer group through Tier Tiger 21. So we're going to talk about all of those different things in this episode. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25 Media, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with done for you podcasts and content marketing. And if you have ever listened to a podcast and thought, hey, should I do that? I've told everyone since I started that you should start a podcast, get involved in podcasts. It's such a great way to have great conversations and to deliver value like Stu's going to do here today and, and pay it forward in many, in many respects. So go to Rise 25 Media and we can uh, help you out. Lots of resources there. Stu, such a pleasure to have you here today. And um, I want to you, you take me back. First of all, so how'd you get started in the food services industry and, and what you were doing back uh, about 24 years ago now? Yeah, well, uh, I originally got into the food service industry. And by the way, thanks for having me, John. I uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, because uh, it actually goes back to high school when uh, I worked in restaurants and decided I wanted to own a restaurant and um, decided the food service industry was my career path. And um, once I went, got, went to Michigan State for hospitality business, uh, went into restaurant management, realized that wasn't the right fit for me, just didn't fit who I was. Um, and uh, then uh, I got a dual degree in marketing. So I decided I wanted to tie my marketing education into the food service industry. And that's how I ended up into uh, the sales and marketing agency side of the food service industry. Got it. Got it. I, you know, I tell people all the time that a great place to start when you're younger is to work in food service. I think for me personally, waiting on tables when I was in high school and college was hugely valuable. I'm curious for you, what was it that you realized about yourself that made you realize that restaurant management was not the thing for you? Um, so I'm a, I'm a really hard worker and I have been since I was probably 10 years old. So um, that doesn't scare me. It was the hours of work during work that scared me uh, with the restaurant business. So I used to work nights, weekends, holidays. And what I learned was I really at that time I was engaged to now my wife and uh, I realized I we were. I wasn't able to spend time with her and then I wouldn't be able to spend eventually time with my family and, uh, and friends and realize that just wasn't the right balance and the right fit for me. And that's why I needed to move out of uh, the, the operation side. So funny. I had a similar kind of realization. I remember when I was working at this barbecue ribs restaurant in high school and college, and it was mandatory. You had to work two out of four of the nights of Christmas Eve, Christmas day, New Year's Eve, New Year's uh, Day. You had to work two out of four of those. 
And when I was working the, at those nights, uh, there were all these other people that were off. They were off work. They were with friends. They were having a good time. And I was schlepping and working really hard. And I thought, you know, I want to be relaxing when everyone else is relaxing. I want to be working hard when everyone else is, is relaxing. You know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So a, a tipping point for me was Christmas Eve doing physical inventory of a, uh, in a restaurant. We're counting every bottle in the bar. And that was kind of it for me uh, when I realized, okay, I, I need to, I need to figure something else out. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough, tough uh, industry for sure. Um, now I want to ask you about, you had a partner from the beginning uh, 1997. It didn't work out with that partner. Um, take us through that. How did you realize that it wasn't the right partnership for you? Because it sounds like once you jettisoned that relationship and rebranded the business, uh, that's when things really took off for you. Yeah. And, and, and when um, my previous partner and I start got together and we merged two businesses together and um, the reason, you know, it, it made a lot of sense on paper. It was a beautiful partnership. Um, uh, the manufacturers he represented didn't conflict with mine. The people side where his strengths were, where some of our weaknesses, where our strengths were, where some of his weaknesses. So on paper, it looked beautiful and, and sounded great. Uh, the realization was, uh, he was a very different person than I was. And sometimes, you know, uh, that can work. This, uh, we just, you know, what I learned uh, uh, down the road was how important values are and core values and our alignment wasn't there, our vision wasn't there. And I didn't learn that for quite a while. Uh, and and uh, so it took some time. And probably the reason it took time is when we started our business together, uh, um, our the business was growing. So when things are going good, we're not looking under the hood for what's wrong. We're just trying to keep up with it and keep it growing. It's when we hit a ceiling and we our business got stuck. That's when you look under the hood and you try to figure out, well, what's not working anymore? And that's when, you know, you discover a lot of things that were there, but you didn't see them. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you unwind it? Was that challenging to unwind the business? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, it, 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 it was more emotionally challenging than operationally challenging. Um, uh, and honestly, I, I was part of a peer-to-peer -peer business owner group in, in the Detroit area. And it was, and if I wasn't part of that group, I'd probably still be working with the guy, or, or because it was those members of the group, and, and I used to be on the agenda every month because I constantly had partnership issues, and then finally one of them said, "You need to, you and Fred need to split up. You need to, you got to part ways. You need to get rid of him." And I, it literally, seriously, never crossed my mind that was even an option. And um, and once it did, I couldn't let go of it. And until I reached again, kind of one of those other tipping points. At that point, it was there was no return. It either either I buy him, he buy me, or we sell the business because I realized I could not continue on in that partnership. Yeah. And was it once you came to that realization and you started to talk about unwinding it, then was it difficult to do? Were there challenges along the way? Um, you know, it, it took a it took about a six month period uh, until we actually figured out what we were doing. At first, he was actually going to buy me out. And, and until one of my trusted employees who was on our leadership team came up to me, closed the door, said, you can't let that happen. If that happens, this business is going to fall apart. And all these people that you work with and built this business and, and depend on you are, gonna, are, are not going to have jobs. And it was that was a, a, one of those turning points for me that really helped me make a whole mind shift change. Yeah, but that's a big change. So how do you take that conversation and then go to your business partner that you're unwinding things with and say, okay, I know you're going to buy me out, but it turns out, you know, 
the guys here, they like me better. So uh, why don't I buy you out instead? Well, um, he kind of set it up for that opportunity for me to switch it. <laughs> um, he really, you know, part of our partnership issues was he really didn't listen to what I, you know, what I was communicating. So his view, his thought was, I just want to get out of the business. He could not hear, which I communicated clearly, that I can't be in business with him. Mm. So, um, so uh, he put together a, uh, at the last minute, shifted a deal, the deal, and uh, it's called, it's called a suicide uh, clause, mm. which I didn't even realize we had in our agreement. And he basically uh, came at at me with a low bulb offer um, that either I accept it or if I don't accept it, I could flip it and then he has to buy me out at those same terms. Mm -hmm. that's, so that's exactly what I did. Um, I, I, can, I can tell you exactly the conversation. I can see it in my mind. I remember that moment vividly, that discussion because uh, it was, uh, you know, one of those things that leaves an imprint in, 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 in your, in your mind forever. Right. Right. Now, um, how much later after that was it that you started working with Gino Wickman? And for those who don't know who Gino is, um, you know, created entrepreneurial operating system, EOS wrote a book called traction. That was really what the basis of that, um, doesn't do the type of, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one work anymore because he's built this huge system. We've got lots of, I've had a number of different EOS implementers on, on the show. Um, but tell me about, you know, working with Gino. Yeah. So um, just to back up. So we were about a year into working with Gino when the realization hit me as to why we hit a ceiling and got stuck. And it had to, and it was all about my partner, my ex-partner, myself, because that, you know, going through the EOS experience um, where we identified our core values, our core focus, uh, our sweet spot, where we're going long term, that is when the reality hit me that the reason we got stuck in the first place was we don't align from a core value standpoint, we don't share a common vision. We had two different cultures going on in our organization. Uh, Fred, sorry, his culture, my culture, based on the different offices that we were located at. And um, so you and weren't the, you weren't working out of the same office. No, that's the only reason we lasted as long as we did, um, is because we didn't. Um, and uh, it was that reality, you know, when I got you know really understood more about our vision understood you know about right people in the right seats had you know, we started actually looking at data and scorecards and then it really i got i really got clarity as to what was going on and what wasn't going on and i really needed to look in the mirror and realized it it, it was it really was he and i that were causing the issue and the two of us can't survive together. So one of us needs to make, uh, one of us needs to move forward. One of us needs to exit. Right, right. Um, and, and so during this time period or, or following this time period, um, you managed to um, scale it up quite substantially, eventually um, expanding across different regions and across 10 different states, um, over a billion dollars in sales. And you're selling at this time sales and marketing training. What were you selling at this period of time? So um, uh, we were, you know, our, the old term was we were food brokers. The new term, uh, we were sales and marketing agencies. And um, we represented and provided sales and marketing services to manufacturers of foods, food products for the food service industry. So food consumed away from home restaurants, schools, colleges, hospitals, anywhere there's a lot of people outside of the home, those were our type of, of customers. And um, so that was the business we were in. And um, uh, it was, yeah, we, we scaled it. It was, um, uh, it was really working with Gino, having kind of that third neutral party that helped guide us. Um, and, and, and it was also the key was, so it was after I changed business partners, brought 
brought in a new business partner. Uh, Mike and I were, I, I was a partner with Mike at a previous business. So I trusted him. Um, we aligned from our core values perfectly. We shared the long-term vision of where we were going. And once we had literally the right people in the right seats, uh, you know, it's a term from Jim Collins in the book, Good to Great, uh, that is when we literally took off. Um, and, and it was not long after I parted ways with my previous partner, Mike came in, got on the same page, uh, made some changes on our leadership team, and boom, we then started, took off. We had a plan. We had a vision and we started executing on it. I, I knew exactly what I needed to do to help take our organization to the next level. And that's what I, I, I focused a good 50 plus percent of my time on that. And I'm curious, um, talking about uh, a, you know partnering with Mike after your previous experience, what if anything did you do to ensure that would be a good partnership or how did you know that it would be a good partnership before you yeah. decided to partner uh one i had a i had a long history with mike previously um and we were business partners in a, a food brokerage company before um before uh steiner wolf and wolf group and so i knew mike very well, um, we we yeah, had you know, we were invested in uh, uh, real estate and some other things as well. So I, I um, had full trust in him, knew him very well. He knew me. We again aligned uh, our core values, fit beautifully. So there was so much trust, and that was one that was a key thing that was lacking between Fred and I. There, there was no trust, um, and he continually proved that to me. And um, uh, but with Mike, uh, I knew I had that trust, I, and and, um, and he really, you know, one of the things we did was he was had a really strong financial background. So Mike was Mike focused on the finance side of our business. My strengths were I, I call it the front of the house because I'm <laughs> coming from the food service industry. Uh, was working with our, our, our clients, our customers, our employees. I was kind of the front of the house. Mike was the back of the house. We focused uh, our energies there and we were a great, perfect combination of kind of that visionary integrator relationship. And, uh, and that is why our business was able to truly take off. That's yeah. what I and you know, during this period of time, you actually acquired 10 different companies, 10 strategic acquisitions. So um, take us through that. What, what made you realize that that's what you needed at that time? Yeah, so we were in a very um, fragmented industry. There were literally hundreds of food brokers all over the country. Um, where I was based in Michigan, we probably had 30 different food brokers in the food service industry. And um, all had certain didn't, little different niches and things like that, all independently, locally owned. And uh, we saw this as an opportunity where the industry was gonna consolidate. And we just needed to be positioned well for it. And um, when 2009 hit and the economic crisis hit, it's what helped fuel the um, consolidation in the food service industry, because prior to that, the food service industry was growing double digit every year. 2009 hit, people lost jobs, uh, and the food service industry, which is based off a of disposable income, started to shrink. And that's the first time ever in, the in, in that industry that I was in, did it ever shrink. Otherwise, it, it grew every year. Mm. That's what started the consolidation. So I, uh, I started meeting with food brokers first regionally in the Michigan, you know, in um, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, and uh, sharing our vision because we had implemented EOS. 
we had uh, we literally had our vision crystallized in writing on paper, which most other brokers had no clue. They had no idea what a vision was. Um, so for us to be able to share who we were, where we're going, how we're going to get there, really helped tell a, a consistent story. And really, because what I was trying to share the vision is to find others, other companies that had similar core values that would understand the vision and want to be a part of that vision. And because uh, we were looking for uh, other brokers that wanted to um, not retire, but really have some ownership in the Wolf Group. So through our, uh, our, our strategic acquisitions throughout the Midwest, uh, we offered the partners, the owners of those firms, uh, you know, it could be this one deal, but we could have had two or three different types of programs for those owners based on what they wanted. And, but we wanted local ownership. That was a key to our strategy is that we had to have engaged local ownership in the market. And that helped us fuel and help bring together because otherwise we had, we had all these entrepreneurs that built and ran their own businesses, but we needed to have a model and a system and a process that we can uh, immediately flip everyone onto that we knew worked so we could then get, get scale because right. we need consistency to scale your business. And, you know, that's such a hard thing because I've heard statistics that, you know, something like, 70 80 percent of acquisitions don't go well or they aren't successful so what did you do to ensure that these acquisitions were successful especially given that you know the ownership's going to remain on they've probably been doing things a certain way for a long time have an idea of the way that things should be done you're introducing a new way of doing things and you're you're expanding into new geographic territory so it's maybe further away, a couple of states away? How do you monitor it to make sure that they're actually implementing these things? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy. However, I definitely try not to so learn. Not so sure about that, but I appreciate I, the humility. <laughs> I, I try to learn from experience. So my experience that I learned from was Fred and I, we did not share common values. So the most important thing I looked for when I would meet with other brokers in other parts of uh, the country, did, did our values align? If our values align, we had a much greater chance of success. And I, so I didn't focus on, well, do their manufacturers fit with our manufacturers? Because that's what I looked at when my original partner and I got together. And it looked great, but didn't work. Um, so Nine out of the 10 acquisitions we did worked beautifully. One didn't, and it's because I, I broke my own rule and I had one of our largest manufacturers um, kind of help, uh, kind of pushed us to make this acquisition because they needed that acquisition to happen. And we did it, and it, it was a mistake it, mm. uh, uh, because the owner of that brokerage. I'd never met a pathological liar before, um, but I, I did. I, I, mm. I ended up meeting one mm. and uh, it's really an interesting experience. And I, I definitely learned from that, but um, I, I broke my own rule and I didn't listen to my, my gut about the core value alignment. But uh, it kind of went with, hey, we need this manufacturer to align with us in all these states. I need to make this happen. Right. And it cost us a lot of time, money, energy, resources, uh, and frustration. But we fixed it. But it took, it took a lot of everything I just said. Right, right. Now, um, what questions do you ask to ensure that a company you're considering uh, acquiring uh, has values that are aligned with yours? So I, I would ask, you know, how do they interact with their people? What, you know, what are their priorities? Um, what's important to them? Um, how do they communicate with each other? How do they, how do they, um, how do they, uh, you know, per, you know, work together? Um, you know, it was questions along those lines, um, and I would get a feel. You, you. 
I can get a real good feel just in an, you know, when I'm in an office and you can feel when things just walking around the you, office. Yeah. yeah. You can Is there feel tension? When things, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. When things are really working well, right. when they're not. And Do people uh, cower when the boss comes around the corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, you, I, I became very sensitive to those things. So I'd be looking for, you know, behaviors. And um, I look for consistency when I'm in the office one day and how is it another time? And, uh, you know, and I would talk to uh, I'd get feedback from people outside the organization. How do you like working with them? You know, how do they treat their people? Uh, How do they treat you? And, and you you know, you pick up and you learn. Yeah. Um, April of 2013, you decide to sell the company. What inspired that? So um, prior to April, once we made our strategic acquisitions throughout the Midwest, that now we were a strong regional player. So the next, our next plan was to become national. And so, um, uh, so what I did was I took my roadshow that I did in the Midwest and took it to other parts of the country. Uh, actually, um, I think it was about April or May of. 2012, uh, I had about 40 different brokerage owners all come together in Dallas, Texas at the airport um, at a hotel there to share the vision of us, uh, of the of the industry consolidating to a national, uh, that we're going to need national representation. And uh, interesting. So you recruited them all to come to one event to kind of pitch them all on the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I had individual meetings with all of them, but needed to bring, start bringing it together. Um, I had a private equity firm that was very interested to help with this. And um, one of the things, one of the lessons I learned from that was as he, as he pointed out, because he was there, it's really hard to, um, you know, to herd a lot of cats all at once. And um, so uh, we tried, first we were trying to do it all at one time, then we realized, you know what, let's focus in on the other four regions of the country, looking for regional brokers like us that fit our values, shared the vision. We We needed them to share the vision that the industry was gonna do much further and deeper consolidation and that eventually it's going to get down to three or four national brokers and then a handful of small or regional brokers. And that's exactly where we're at today. Um, it's been like that for probably the last five years. Uh, but we were, you know, we were, we had the vision, we were planning for it. And during that, once we identified our other regional brokers we wanted to partner with, um, the so on the other side of the food industry is the retail grocery industry. And um, so the brokers and the retail grocery industry, they had the big three decided they wanted to get into the food service business. They started acquiring brokers. And it was during that time and, and they were writing checks and that got a lot of attention. We were trying to do more of an equity merger uh, of companies. And uh, the, the the cash went out, and um, so uh, you know it started. Uh, so they realized started. it'd be harder to make acquisitions yeah. as you went along. Got it. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Got mm-hmm. it. So when you sold then to Acosta, did you feel like you? I don't want to say it was your only option, but you kind of feel like you needed to do it. Well, I, I you know it's funny because when it rains, it pours. So when when Acosta uh, approached us, at, we were kind of thinking that was the only uh, option, but we then had two other options um, <laughs> that were interested. All of a sudden, we and we never put up, you know, we never said we're selling, but all of a sudden we had three companies interested in acquiring us, and um, so you know what, we listened to what we learned. Um, and we really felt at that time, the CEO and CFO of Acosta really were great people. Align, we aligned beautifully with them from a value standpoint. We sh- again shared a common vision for food, the food industry. So we felt they were the right fit. And that's where we focused our time and energy to put that deal together. And I don't regret it. 
um, the industry did further consolidate and it was, you know, it was <laughs> the old saying being at the right time at the right place. Mm -hmm. And it was, and we were positioned beautifully for it because once we realized the vision and that we needed to be prepared for it, we were working on it for five years to be ready for it. This isn't something you just say, okay, we need to start process, figure out our processes, figuring out our systems. And, and these things don't happen overnight. So it took five years to really get the company to the point where we have that ability to really scale and grow. And, um, uh, and so it was the right time. It, just, yeah. it really was. I'm fascinated by, um, you know, people that have been on these types of journeys from, you know, small little company to over a billion dollars in sales, 160 plus employees and, and how you learn along the way. Cause we're constantly evolving up, leveling our network, meeting new people, you know, you had Gino as your coach, you had your peer group. How did you continue to learn the new challenges that were before you, like acquiring companies and expanding geographic territories? Um, did, you, did you find that, um, you know, you needed to up-level your network? Were there new people you were learning from? Yeah. Tell yeah. me a little bit about uh, the relationships that kind of helped you along the way. Yeah, so some of the relationships were... So there were a couple. Uh, one, I, I started a peer group within our industry. It was called the Smart Share Group. So it was other brokers from around the country. And um, so we shared together. But the other side was uh, I became more involved with some of the bigger manufacturers, um, like a General Mills, for an example. Uh, we represented them and being part of their uh, advisory board. Uh, so I got to really connect with senior leadership and, you know, sh you know, hearing their vision and hearing uh, what they see the industry doing really helped cement things. I had ideas and thoughts, but it really helped give me a little bit more confidence into the direction we were going and the plans we had. That's great. Um, so you sell the company and you decide to become a EOS implementer. Um, the what got you there? You decided to go back and, and help others. Um, how did you come to that realization that having benefited from the system yourself, that that was something you actually wanted to do and help other businesses with? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I stayed in with a past for uh, several years and, and really interesting, unique positions. And I enjoyed it when I didn't enjoy it is when, okay, it was time to start to figure out what my next chapter was. Uh, and I worked with Gina was our business coach for eight to nine years. Um, so I really got to know Gina well. We became friends. And, um, you know, I was having coffee with him one day and saying, you know, I'm thinking about my next chapter. I, I think EOS implementation might be something. He goes, I think you'd be great at it. And, um, and I talked to my wife and, uh, and said, you know, I, I, in this chapter of my life, I want something, uh, I just want flexibility. Uh, I want to do something that I love and I'm passionate about, and I want to help other people. And um, so EOS checked all the boxes for me. I think what was important is this isn't, the EOS process and system isn't just something I've read about. I lived it. And um, living it, having that experience, scaling my business, building it to something that I never thought was possible and, and, um, and realizing that uh, sh just showed me the potential. And so I, I just wanted to have that opportunity to do that with others. And that's what I'm doing. And I absolutely love it. Yeah. And you also became a, uh, a chair. I don't know if that's a term that you use for Tiger 21, which is a similar kind of peer to peer group, similar to you mentioned that you were involved in a local level. So what is Tiger 21? And, um, you know, tell me what you do through that. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I'd never heard of Tiger 21 until a couple of years ago. Um, and Tiger 21 is a peer to peer learning group. It is targeted to high net worth individuals. 
And so those uh, high net worth in tiger terms is considered having $10 million of investable assets. Um, and uh, what the reason Tiger 21 was started and founded back in, I think, 1999 by a gentleman named Michael Sonnenfeld in uh, New York was uh, he had built a, a great wealth, but didn't, didn't have people to talk to about some issues and challenges that come with wealth. Um, and, uh, and so that's how Tiger was started. Um, uh, the group I have, uh, I have 15 members. They're all entrepreneurs. Half of them <laughs> have run their businesses on EOS um, <laughs> that got them to that level. Uh, and and um, uh, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer learning. It is really, um, if you kind of think about it as um, kind of a uh, personal board of directors. And um, I just had my group meeting yesterday and, uh, and it's about sharing and it's about learning and it's about networking together. Um, the majority of the members I'm, I work with are fully engaged in their businesses. As I mentioned, entrepreneurs, uh, some are second generation. And it's about, it's not about so much running your business. It's about you've created wealth. So now how do you hold on to that wealth that you created? How do you grow some of that wealth you created? How do you plan for it? How do you deal with your kids with it and friends and family when you have wealth and maybe they don't have the same type of wealth? Uh, how do you think about taxes and estate planning and all of those types of subjects that we, you know, we just don't talk to uh, uh, about with each other. Um, yeah. and, and, and the group, each member, uh, once a month, uh, each member shares what we call a portfolio defense. So they are literally sharing their entire net worth, where they have their assets invested, what their philosophy is. And I help them to prepare three to four or five questions of what they want the group to respond to. What do they want them to focus on? You know, we don't know what we don't know. So it's um, trying to open up uh, and under and learn from each other and from different perspectives. And, and it's fascinating. Um, it, it's such an interesting time right now, just, you know, coming out of this pandemic, as we record this in September, 2021, um, that, you know, the economy has just been interesting. Um, you shared a bit, written a little bit about, um, you know, cryptocurrencies that have been coming along on your, on your LinkedIn page and stuff like that. Um, what, what do you, what are your, what's your eye on that's interesting right now without, I guess we could do a whole nother hour long episode, probably talking about this, but you know, what are some interesting areas that have been subject to discussion if I were a fly on the wall, um, in your group? Yeah. So, uh, we had a really interesting discussion last month on opportunities, opportunity zones, investing into, uh, real estate and those avenues and some potential tax savings. Um, yesterday, we had a speaker on aging parents, uh, how to deal with parents that, you know, uh, and how to deal with their, not just from a wealth standpoint, but providing different services, estate planning. Um, I had a speaker, you know, there's some potential new tax, uh, tax laws going into effect in the near future. Had a great speaker helping to open up my members' eyes and ears to what those implications could be and how they need to start to plan and execute uh, for those uh, when they when they you know when they fall into place. So um, estate planning is a big thing. Uh, you know, you think most people have really put a lot of time, energy, and thought into their estate. Uh, most can say they can check it off, but it is not deep enough or strong enough. So it needs more. Uh, it definitely needs more time and attention. And even people at the great wealth that I have the opportunity to work with are finding they have a lot of holds and they mm -hmm. need to uh, have expertise really review it. So, um, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, the, uh, the, the different um, subjects, the different investment vehicles and opportunities, uh, and, and it's really has an impact 
and, yeah. and changing people's lives. Yeah. Um, you know, we were chatting beforehand and you shared a question that you asked at your group yesterday, which I'm going to turn back on you because it was such a great question. What is one life lesson you learned the hard way? Yeah. So uh, that lesson was I, I, I didn't listen to my gut. I did not listen to that inner voice that when I originally started going back to my original partner, when I met with him the first time and the second time, I knew in my heart, my stomach was telling me, don't do this. But on paper, like I said, it looked good. And that, that is the lesson I learned the hard way. I really need to trust in my instinct, what that inner voice is saying, what my stomach is telling me. And, uh, and I'm trying to, uh, trying to do that mu much more today than ever before. That's great. All right. I want to, we're a little short on time. So I, I want to ask the last question I always ask, which is, you know, I'm a big fan of gratitude, especially, especially um, expressing gratitude to those who've been helpful um, professionally along the way. So if you look around at your peers or contemporaries, you know, others in your industry, however you want to define that, and you've mentioned a few here, Gino and others. Who do you respect? Who do you admire that's doing good work these days? Yeah, so there's two people that pop in my head when you said that, and they're very near and dear to me. One is Gino Wickman. Uh, he was life-changing for me and still is to this day. Um, and the other is my uh, was my partner, Mike, that um, came in after my <laughs> first partner because I didn't realize what a partnership, what a healthy partnership could be. <clears throat> and, um, and having the, be able to have trust in somebody else to that extent, besides my wife. Um, and um, the, the, both those people had dynamic impact on my life previous to building my business and to this day. And I feel such gratitude that they're part of my life. That's great. Uh, Stu, this has been wonderful. Where can people go to connect with you or to learn more about the various different things you're involved in? Sure. Yeah. So um, my, my website is uh, wolf with two Fs, leadership, LLC.com. Um, uh, email is swolf at wolf leadership, LLC. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, Certainly uh, sell 248-310-8026 or on LinkedIn. Excellent, Stu. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it, John. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.